it's Sunday, January 31st, and we're going to read the third lecture, Yoga for Yellow Bellies, which is the seventh lecture of eight lectures on yoga. Dear children, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. You will remember that this last week our study of yoga has led us to the fathers of the church. We saw that their philosophy and science, in following an independent route, has brought us to the famous exclamation of Tertullian, Certum est quia impossibile est. How right the Church has been to deny the authority of reason. We are almost tempted to inquire for a moment that the Church means by faith. St. Paul tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. I do not think, then, that we are to imagine this word faith to mean what the lecherous, gross-bellied boor Martin Luther maintained. The faith of which he speaks is anything but a substance, and as for evidence, it is nothing but the power, as the schoolboy said, of believing that which we know to be untrue. To have any sensible meaning at all, faith must mean experience, and that view is in exact accord with the conclusion to which we were led in my last lecture. Nothing is any use to us unless it be a certainty unshakable by criticism of any kind, and there is only one thing in the universe which complies with these conditions, the direct experience of spiritual truth. Here and here only do we find a position in which the great religious minds of all time and all climes coincide. It is necessarily above dogma, because dogma consists of a collection of intellectual statements, each of which, and also its contradictory, can easily be disputed and overthrown. You are probably aware that in the Society of Jesus, the postulants are trained to debate on all these highly controversial subjects. They put up a young man to prove any startling blasphemy that happens to occur to them, and the more shocked the young man is, the better the training for his mind, and the better service he will give to the society in the end but only if the mind has been completely disabused of its confidence in its own rightness, or even in the possibility of being right. The rationalist, in a shallow fashion, always contends that this training is the abnegation of mental freedom. On the contrary, it is the only way to obtain that freedom. In the same society, the training in obedience is based on a similar principle. The priest has to do what his superior orders him, perinde ac cadaver. Protestants always represent that this is the most outrageous and indefensible tyranny, the poor devil, they say, is bludgeoned into having no will of his own. That is pure nonsense. By abnegating his will through the practice of holy obedience, his will has become enormously strong, so strong that none of his natural instincts, desires, or habits can intrude. He has freed his will of all these inhibitions. He is a perfect function of the machinery of the order. In the general of the society has concentrated the power of those separate wills, just as in the human body every cell should be completely devoted in its particular quality to the concentrated will of the organism. In other words, the Society of Jesus has created a perfect imitation of the skeleton of the original creation, living man. It has complied with the divinely instituted order of things, and that is why we see that the body, which was never numerically important, has been one of the greatest influences in the development of Europe. It has not always worked perfectly, but that has not been the fault of the system. And, even as it is, its record has been extraordinary. And one of the most remarkable things about it is that its greatest and most important achievements have been in the domain of science and philosophy. It has done nothing in religion, or rather, where it has meddled with religion, it has only done harm. What a mistake, and why? For the simple reason that it was in a position to take no notice of religion. All these matters were decided for it by the Pope, or by the councils of the Church, and the society was therefore able to free itself from the perplexities of religion, in exactly the same way as the novice obtains complete freedom from his moral responsibilities by sinking his personal fantasies in the will of the superior. I should like to mention here that the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius are in their essence really admirable yoga practices. They have, it is true, a tinge of magical technique, and they have been devised to serve a dogmatic end. That was, however, necessary, and it was good magic too at that, because the original will of the founder was to produce a war engine as a counterblast to the Reformation. He was very wise to devise a plan, irrespective of its abstract merits as philosophy, which would efficiently serve that single purpose. The only trouble has been that this purpose was not sufficiently cosmic in scope to resist internal forces. Having attained the higher planes by practice of these exercises, they found that the original purpose of the society was not really adequate to their powers. They were, so to speak, over-engined. They stupidly invaded that spiritual sphere of the other authorities whom they were founded to support, and thus we see them actually quarreling with the Pope, while failing signally to obtain possessions of the papacy. Being thus thwarted in their endeavors, and confined in their purpose, they redoubled the ardor of their exercises, 
and it is one of the characteristics of all spiritual exercises, if honestly and efficiently performed, that they constantly lead you into higher planes, where all dogmatic considerations, all intellectual concepts, are invalid. Hence we find that it is not altogether surprising that the general of the order, in his immediate circle, have been supposed to be atheists. If that were true, it would only show that they have been corrupted by their preoccupation with the practical politics of the world, which it is impossible to conduct on any but an atheistic basis. It is brainless hypocrisy to pretend otherwise, and should be restricted to the exclusive use of the foreign office. It would perhaps be more sensible to suppose that the heads of the order have really attained the greatest heights of spiritual knowledge and freedom, and it is quite possible that the best term to describe their attitude would be either pantheistic or Gnostic. Their consideration should be of the greatest use to us now that we have come to discuss in more detail the results of the yoga practices. There is, it is true, a general similarity between the ecstatic outbursts of the great mystics all over the world. Comparisons have often been drawn by students of the subject. I will only detain you with one example. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. What is this injunction? It is a generalization of St. Augustine's love and do what thou wilt. But in the book of the law, lest the hearer should be deluded into a spasm of antinomianism, there is a further explanation. Love is the law, love under will. However, the point is that it is no use discussing the results of yoga. Whether the yoga be the type recommended by Lao Tzu or Patanjali or St. Ignatius of Loyola, because for our first postulate we have that these subjects are incapable of discussion. To argue about them only causes us to fall into the pit of because, and there to perish with the dogs of reason. The only use, therefore, of describing our experiences is to enable students to get some sort of idea of the sort of thing that is going to happen to them when they attain success in the practices of yoga. We have David saying in the Psalms, I hate thoughts, but thy law do I love. We have St. Paul saying, The carnal mind is enmity against God. One might almost say that the essence of St. Paul's epistles is a struggle against mind. We war not against flesh and blood. You know the rest. I can't be bothered to quote it all. Ephesians 6.12 it is St. Paul, I think, who describes Satan, which is his name for the enemy, owing to his ignorance of his history of the world, as the prince of the power of the air, that is, of the ruach, of the intellect. And we must never forget that what operated the conversion of St. Paul was the vision on the road to Damascus. It is particularly significant that he disappeared into the desert of Arabia for three years before coming forward as the apostle to the Gentiles. St. Paul was a learned rabbi. He was the favored pupil of the best expositor of the Hebrew law. And in the single moment of his vision, all arguments were shattered at a single stroke. We are not told that St. Paul said anything at the time, but went quietly on his journey. That is the great lesson, not to discuss the results. Those of you who possess a copy of the Equinox of the Gods may have been very much surprised at the extraordinary injunction in the comment, the prohibition of the discussion of the book. I myself did not fully understand that injunction. I do now. Let us now deal with a few of the phenomena which occurred during the practices of Pratyahara. Very early during my retirement in Candy, I had been trying to concentrate by slanting my eyes towards the tip of my nose. This, by the way, is not a good practice. One is able to strain the eyes. But what happened was that I woke up in the night, my hand touched a nose, I immediately concluded that someone was in the room. Not at all. I only thought so because my nose had passed away from the region of my observation by the practice of concentrating upon it. The same sort of thing occurs with adequate concentration on any object. It is connected, curiously enough, with the phenomena of invisibility. When your mind has gone so deeply into itself that it is unconscious of itself and its surroundings, one of the most ordinary results is that the body becomes invisible to other people. I do not think it would make any difference for a photograph, though I have no evidence for saying this, but it has happened to me on innumerable occasions. It was an almost daily occurrence when I was in Sicily. A party of us used to go down to a very beautiful bay of sand, once jutted fantastically shaped islets of rock. It is rimmed by cliffs encrusted with jewels of marine life. The way was over a bare hillside. Except for a few hundred yards of vineyard, there was no cover, nay, not for a rabbit. But it often happened that one of the party would turn to speak to me and fail to see me. I have often known this to happen when I was dictating. My chair was apparently empty. Incidentally, the faculty which I think is exercised, as a rule, unconsciously may become a natural magical power. It happened to me on one occasion that a very large number of excited people were looking for me with no friendly intentions, but I had a feeling of lightness, of ghostliness, as if I were a shadow moving soundlessly about the street, and in actual fact none of the people who were looking for me gave the slightest indication that they were aware of my presence. There is a curious parallel to this incident in one of the Gospels where we read that they picked up stones to stone him, but he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. 
There is another side to this business of Pratyahara, one that may be described as completely contradictory against what we have been talking about. If you concentrate your attention upon one portion of the body with the idea of investigating it, that is, I suppose, allowing the mind to move within very small limits, the whole of your consciousness becomes concentrated in that very small part. I used to practice this a good deal in my retirement at Lake Bisqueni. I would usually take a finger or a toe and identify my whole consciousness with the small movements which I allowed it to make. It would be futile to go into much detail about this experience. I can only say that until you acquire the power, you have no idea of the sheer wonder and delight of that endlessly quivering orgasm. If I remember rightly, this practice and its result were one of the principal factors which enabled me afterwards to attain what is called the trance of wonder, which pertains to the grade of the master of the temple, and is a sort of complete understanding of the organism of the universe, and its static adoration of its marvel. This trance is very much higher than the beatific vision, for always in the latter it is the heart, the friend, which is involved. In the former it is the newest, the divine intelligence of man, whereas the heart is only the center of the intellectual and moral faculties. But so long as you are occupying yourself with the physical, the results will only be on that plane, and the principal effect of these concentrations on small parts of the body is the understanding, or rather the appreciation of sensuous pleasure. This, however, is infinitely refined, exquisitely intense. It is often possible to acquire a technique by which the skilled artist can produce this pleasure in another person. Map out, say, three square inches of skin anywhere and it is possible by extreme gentle touches to excite in the patient all the possible sensations of pleasure of which that person is capable. I know that this is a very extraordinary claim, but it is a very easy one to substantiate. The only thing I'm afraid of is that experts may be carried away by the rewards, instead of getting the real value of the lesson, which is that the gross pleasures of the senses are absolutely worthless. This practice, so far as it is useful at all, should be regarded as the first step towards emancipation from the thrall of the bodily desires, of the sensations self-destructive of the thirst for pleasure. I think this is a good opportunity to make a little digression in favor of Maha Satipatthana. This practice was recommended by the Buddha in very special terms, and it is the only one which he speaks so highly. He told his disciples that if they only stuck to it, sooner or later they would reach full attainment. The practice consists of an analysis of the universe in terms of consciousness. You begin by taking some very simple and regular bodily exercise, such as the movement of the body in walking, or the movements of the lungs in breathing. You keep on noting what happens. I am breathing out, I am breathing in, I am holding my breath, as the case may be. Quite without warning, one is appalled of the shock of the discovery that what you have been thinking is not true. You have no right to say, I am breathing in. All you really know is that there is a breathing in. You therefore change your note, and you say, there is a breathing in, there is a breathing out, and so on. And very soon, if you practice assiduously, you get another shock. You have no right to say there is a breathing. All you know is that there is a sensation of that kind. Again, you change your conception of your observation, and one day make the discovery that the sensation has disappeared. All you know is that there is a perception of a sensation of breathing in or breathing out. Continue, and that is once more discovered to be an illusion. What you find is that there is a tendency to perceive a sensation of the natural phenomenon. The former stages are easy to assimilate intellectually, one assents to them immediately that one discovers them, but with regard to the tendency, this is not the case, at least it was not so for my own part. It took me a long while before I understood what was meant by tendency. To help you to realize this, I should like to find a good illustration. For instance, a clock does nothing at all but offer indications of the time. It is so constructed that this is all we can know about it. We can argue about whether the time is correct and that means nothing at all, unless, for example, we know whether the clock is controlled electronically from an astronomical station where the astronomer happens to be sane, and in what part of the world the clock is, and so on. I remember once when I was in Tangue, just inside the Chinese frontier in Yunnan, the hour of noon was always telegraphed to the consulate from Beijing. This was a splendid idea because electricity was practically instantaneous. The unfortunate thing was, it was unfortunate, which I doubt, that the messages had to be relayed at a place called Yangcheng. The operators there had the good sense to smoke opium most of the time, so occasionally a batch of telegrams would arise, a dozen or so in a bunch, stating that it was noon or so in Beijing on various dates. So all the gross phenomena, all these sensations and perceptions, are illusion. All that one could really say was that there was a tendency on the part of some lunatic in Beijing to tell the people at Tang Wei what o'clock it was. But with this fourth skanda it is not final. With practice it also appears as an illusion and one remains with nothing but the bare consciousness of the existence of such a tendency. I cannot tell you very much about this because I have not worked it out very thoroughly myself, 
but I very much doubt whether consciousness has a meaning at all, as a translation of the word vinyanam. I think that a better translation would be experience, used in the sense in which we have been using it hitherto, as the direct reality behind and beyond all remark. I hope you will appreciate how difficult it is to give a reasoned description, however tentative, of these phenomena, still less to classify them properly. They have a curious trick of running one into the other. This, I believe, is one of the reasons why it has been impossible to find any real satisfactory literature about yoga at all. The more advanced one's progress, the less one knows, and the more one understands. The effect is simply additional evidence of what I have been saying all this time, that it is very little use discussing things. What is needed is continuous devotion to the practice. Love is the law, love under will. It is Sunday, January 31st, 8 p.m., and we're going to read the summary of Part 1 of Liber Eba. What is genius and how is it produced? Let us take several specimens of the species and try to find some one thing common to all which is not found in other species. Is there any such thing? Yes, all geniuses have the habit of concentration of thought and usually need long periods of solitude to acquire this habit. In particular, the greatest religious geniuses have all retired from the world at one time or another in their lives and begun to preach immediately on their return. Of what advantage is such a retirement? One would expect that a man who so acted would find himself on his return out of touch with his civilization, and in every way less capable than when he left. But each claims, though in different language, to have gained in his absence some superhuman power. Do you believe this? It becomes us ill to reject the assertions of those who are admittedly the greatest of mankind until we can refute them by proof, or at least explain how they may have been mistaken. In this case, each teacher left instructions for us to follow. The only scientific method is for us to repeat their experiments, and so confirm or disprove their results. But their instructions differ widely, and in so far as each was bound by conditions of time, race, climate, and language, there is essential identity in the method. Indeed, it was the great work of the life of Frater Perturabo to prove this. Studying each religious practice of each great religion on the spot, he was able to show the identity and diversity of all, and to formulate a method free from all dogmatic bias, and based only on the ascertained fact of anatomy, physiology, and psychology. Can you give me a brief abstract of this method? The main idea is that the infinite, the absolute, God, the oversoul, or whatever you may prefer to call it, is always present, but veiled or masked by the thoughts of the mind. Just as one cannot hear a heartbeat in a noisy city, yes, then to obtain knowledge of that, it is only necessary to still all thoughts. But in sleep, thought is stilled. True, perhaps roughly speaking, but the perceiving function is stilled also. Then you wish to obtain a perfect vigilance and attention of the mind, uninterrupted by the rise of thoughts? Yes. And how do you proceed? Firstly, we still the body by the practice called asana and secure its ease and regularity of its functions by pranayama. Thus, no messages from the body will disturb the mind. Secondly, by yama and niyama, we still the emotions and passions, and thus prevent them arising to disturb the mind. Thirdly, by pratyahara, we analyze the mind yet more deeply, and begin to control and suppress thought in general of whatever nature. Fourthly, we suppress all other thoughts by a direct concentration upon a single thought. This process, which leads to the highest results, consists of three parts, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi, grouped under the single term, samyama. How can I obtain further knowledge and experience of this? The AA is an organization whose heads have obtained by personal experience to the summit of this science. They have founded a system by which everyone can equally attain, and that with an ease and speed which was previously impossible. The first grade in their system is that of student. A student must possess the following books. 1. The Equinox. 2. 777. 3. Conk Som Pax. 4. The Collected Works of Alistair Crowley. 5. Raja Yoga by Swami Vivekananda. 6. The Siva Samahita or the Hatha Yoga Pratapika. 7. The Tao Te Ching and the Writings of Chuan Tzu. 8. The Spiritual Guide by Miguel de Molinos. 9. Dogma and Ritual of High Magic by Eliphas Levi or its translation by A.E. Wei, Transcendental Magic. 10. The Goetia of the Lamejiton of Solomon the King. These books should be studied well in any case in conjunction with the second part, Magic, Elementary Theory, of this book 4. The study of these books will give a thorough grounding in the intellectual side of their system. After three months, the student is examined in these books. 
and if his knowledge of them is found satisfactory, he may become a probationer receiving Liber 61, and the secret holy book, Liber 65. The principal point of this grade is that the probationer has a master appointed, whose experience can guide him in his work. He may select any practices that he prefers, but in any case must keep an exact record, so that he may discover the relation of cause and effect in his working, and so that the AA may judge of his progress and direct his further studies. After a year of probation, he may be admitted a neophyte to the AA and receive the secret holy book, Liber 7. These are the principal instructions for practice which every probationer should follow out. Liber E, Liber A, Liber O, Liber 3, Liber 30, Liber 175, Liber 200, Liber 206, Liber 913, while the key to magic power is given in Liber 370.